Hi everyone. So welcome to our workshop, Epidemiology for Bioinformatician. I think now the waiting room, there are no people on the waiting room, so we can start our workshop. So this workshop is part of our initiative R for Bioinformatics that we started on September 2020. Uh, I'm Hedjat Nani, I'm bioinformatician at Pasteur Institute of Tunis, and I have the great pleasure today to have with us Chloe Mirzia. Mir Mirzai. So thank you, Chloe, for uh, accepting our invitation. But before moving on and presenting Chloe, we want to introduce you to the Our Ladies and Our Ladies Tunis Initiative. So Mone, please, can you share the video? Uh, hi, everyone. If you can stop sharing your screen, please, Chloe. So oh, yep. Yep, I'll stop sharing. Sorry. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this workshop session. Before starting the workshop, we'll introduce you to the Our Ladies Global and Our Ladies Tunis initiative. The Our community suffers from an underrepresentation of minority genders in every role and area of participation, whether as leaders, package developers, conference speakers, conference participants, educators, or users. As a diversity initiative, the mission of Our Ladies is to achieve proportionate representation by encouraging, inspiring, and empowering people of genders currently underrepresented in the R community and to facilitate individual and collective progress worldwide. Gabriela de Caros founded Our Ladies on October 1, 2012. Our Ladies Global was born and the grant was awarded in September 2016. Since then Our Ladies has grown to 170 chapters in 44 countries and 39,000 members. Our Ladies Tunis is part of Our Ladies initiative and was created in May 2020 by women working as data scientists and biostatisticians and bioinformaticians. Our goal is to create an R community in Tunis and empower underrepresented genders in the R community. This is the core team of Our Ladies Tunis. Come and join our community on social media. This presentation was made with R Markdown. Thank you for watching this video and enjoy our workshop. Thank you, Mune. So, me and Mune, we are co founders of Our Ladies Tunis. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Chloe Mir Mirzai. So, Chloe is a doctoral candidate in a epidemiology at the City University of New York, uh, Graduate School of, Public, he of um, Public Health and Health Policy and the Data Scientist at CUNY Institute for Implementation Science uh, in Population Health. Uh, she has experience designing, implementing and maintaining data collection, management and curation tools on a variety of projects ranging from large national cohort studies to RCTs in topics related to COVID-19, microbiome, HIV, substance use, and mental health. Her own research interest, interests are focused on the role of the microbiome on human health, causal inference of the microbiome, uh, uh, causal inference in mic microbiome uh, research and improving the epidemiological rigor of health and bioinformatics research. Thank you, Chloe, for being with us today. So the screen is yours. Okay, thank you uh, so much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, Good morning to you all, or good evening, wherever, wherever you are. Uh, it's uh, just an honor to be here, and I'm really excited uh, to give this presentation to you today. So as mentioned, I'll be presenting on epidemiology for bioinformaticians. And so as Hadia mentioned, I am a doctoral candidate in epidemiology, and I actually got into bioinformatics 
while I was in the middle of my doctorate. Before that, I had been working kind of in pure public health epidemiology type of research. Uh, and then I, I had a, a chance encounter uh, with Levi Waldron, who is one of the faculty at the school. Uh, and he was like, well, I'm doing this cool microbiome stuff, come work for me. Uh, and that's kind of how I ended up there. Uh, and so my goal with this presentation today is uh, in, in this workshop, it won't, it's not just a presentation, we'll be doing some stuff together and I'll have some questions for you, um, is to uh, talk about the basics of, of epidemiology in, in a context that makes sense for bioinformaticians. Uh, a big part of that will be the, the, uh, the science of, of causal inference. Uh, and so causal inference is the idea of trying to determine what causes something else to happen. And in some of the, the uh, you know, pure sciences, so if you come from a biology background or a chemistry background, that, that's a pretty simple question, right? You can just do an experiment where you, uh, you know, you, you introduce a, a certain chemical or you, um, you know, you, you provide some sort of stimulus and then you see what happens. But often in bioinformatics, and in public health, as well as epidemiology, you you can't do that. It you know it might be unethical to to experiment on, on people in that way, or um, there might be other difficulties. There might be cost or logistical issues. Uh, and so a lot of the work around causal inference emerged. Um, uh, it, it goes it goes back further, but but a lot of it uh, can be traced to uh, the 1950s and the debate over smoking and lung cancer, and a big question that emerged from that in epidemiology is, well, how do we prove that smoking causes lung cancer? Something which I think pretty well accepted today, but back in the 1950s and 60s was much more controversial. And we didn't have a lot of tools for that yet. We had a lot of great statistical tools. We could show there was an association. We could show that people who smoked were much more likely to get lung cancer and that, you know, that th- th- this effect was durable across populations um, and, and it, it didn't seem to change too much, but, but how did we actually, how do we actually prove that, that, that that's a causal relationship? Because as many of us have probably heard, correlation does not equal causation. Um, and so epidemiology uh, has, evolved since then, and, and we've developed some tools for thinking about causal inference, uh, and not just thinking about it, but modeling it, uh, making diagrams, and and thinking through how we can answer these questions of causal inference. And so uh, to get started today, um, well, first off, I should mention that, that this uh, everything I'm presenting today is available in a in a GitHub repository. I will put the link in chat. Um, let's pull up chat real quick. Uh, so if you want to clone this and, and follow along, uh, or you can just follow along with my presentation, uh, what, whatever, whatever you like. Um, uh, but we'll get started uh, with a, a question to you, and, and you can put your answers in chat because I think mics are muted. Uh, in your own words, what is a cause? What does it mean to cause something? And no wrong answers. I, I find this to be sometimes a tough question. And so so I, I would love to hear what people people think. I'll give you a few a few moments to, to type. Don't have to be shy. There's no right or wrong answer to this question. I, I think if there was a right answer, you, you would you would solve a lot of problems we have. Um, okay, right, we, we start getting answers. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've got an answer uh, from, I believe it's uh, Jalal. Uh, they say, 
cause is ideally something that initiates an event. Uh, Muna says something that is associated with a result. I, I think these are these are both great answers. Uh, we've got an answer from uh, is it Propan21 who says it seems to me the cause is the variable who explained better difference of a response variable. Um, oh hi Fatima and Rimsha. I, I, I believe it, if that's the Fatima I work with, but hi, I know Rimsha. Hi Rimsha. Um, something that ha has an impact on the result, an action that gives a cause that results in a consequence from Allah. Yeah, these are all great answers. Uh, it, it's some, yeah, um, it's something that that brings about some kind of effect or a result. It's something that changes something in, in, in life. We can think about this on a, a very simple level, you know, like if, if I pick up my water bottle, I've caused my water bottle to be lifted into the air, but then, it, we can think about on a very small level and think about like, you know, the interaction between atoms and molecules. Uh, and these are all causal relationships where, where uh, different things can, can uh, you know, impact the state of another thing. Um, but it's really hard to actually prove this if, if in scientific cases, because, um, you know, there, there, if I have direct evidence, you know, I can see that I have lifted my water bottle. I'm pretty sure I caused that to happen. But if, if I'm observing something with smoking and lung cancer, we could think that, well, maybe there's some other variable in that relationship between smoking and lung cancer that uh, both um, affected what we think is the cause and what we think is the effect. So uh, a variable like that could be something like maybe there's some genetic factor that causes people to smoke more and also causes them to develop lung cancer. Maybe it maybe there's some you know gene that makes people um, you know both really like smoking and also develop lung cancer. In fact, that was a common theory among people who were skeptical about the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, including the famous statistician uh, uh, Fisher, R.A. Fisher, I believe his name was. Um, he uh, was an avid smoker and he believed uh, that, that there was no relationship, no causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer and that the observed relationship that other researchers were seeing was due to some underlying genetic factor. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, how, how can we measure that? How do we determine whether there was just a genetic factor? Oh, someone mentioned the Bradford Hill criteria. That's excellent. Uh, that's an ex excellent uh, uh, piece of historical epidemiology work. So um, the Bradford Hill criteria, Bradford Hill was uh, an early epidemiologist and statistician who uh, developed these criteria and said, well, if these criteria are true, then there is evidence for a causal relationship. Um, and, and so thank you for mentioning those. So, but what I wanna do is, is step back for a moment and think about, um, uh, I, I think we kind of talked about this first question, but the second question, uh, we, we've talked about kind of causal inference, or I have for a moment. Um, and I, I just want to know, what are some causes that you would be interested in within the context of bioinformatics or your own field of work, study, or research? And maybe while you're typing this out, I'll talk about what I'm interested in, which I'm, I'm interested in um, the microbiome. Uh, and how antibiotics affect it, because I think uh, antibiotics are really interesting because we know they have a very dramatic effect on your microbiome. You know, we, we take them for that reason. We take them to kill bacteria. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that, um, you, know, you know, they don't just kill the bad bacteria. They don't just clear out your sinus infection or your strep throat, but they also you know, affect your gut microbiome, and they could be killing benign or, or beneficial bacteria. And so what I'm interested in is the role that antibiotics have, particularly as uh, a lot of microbiome research uh, 
just excludes anyone who's recently on antibiotics. And I'm curious of whether there's a there's a better way to uh, to think about the effects of antibiotics on the microbiome. And so, uh, yeah, if you could type in chat, you know, is, is there anything that you've been thinking about in your own research in bioinformatics or, or you know, at any field of study or work that you're in? Uh, that, that you think that there's a causal question that's important that you're thinking about or or that you'd like to think about more? I'll give people a second to answer. Uh, excellent. So the, the association between inflammation and psychosis. So that, that is a very interesting, you know, causal question as, as there's a lot of research into how inflammation may um, cause uh, a variety of chronic illnesses um, or potentially exacerbate existing sy symptoms, making them worse. So, so that, that's a great example of, of a cause that, that would be very interesting and, and important for human health. Any others? Uh, the genetic cause of antihypertensive drug responses. Uh, yeah, that, that's another great area is, is uh, how, how uh, our genetics can affect how uh, we respond to different treatments, um, and in this case, hypertensive drugs. You know, anti sorry, anti hypertensive drugs. You know, you you see differential responses um, from from people, and so it's it is interesting to consider uh, how our genes might cause us to respond differently to the same drug. Uh, so these are these are two great examples. There, there's a whole lot more, of course, out there, and I encourage you all to think think about your own research and think about the causal questions that might underlie a lot of what you do. Um, but I haven't really defined a cause yet, have I? And that that's the next step uh, that I want to get into. Uh, and so uh, the definition of a cause that, that has been developed for research is called the counterfactual definition of a cause. Uh, so it's very hard to define a cause a, a, as uh, in terms of what we observe, because that might just be an association. And so the counterfactual definition of a cause says, what would have happened had the event of interest or what we might call the exposure or the potential cause had it not occurred, um, so so if um, you know the cause had not occurred, what would have happened instead? And so this is a little hard to wrap your mind around at first, I think, at times. So I like to think with a very concrete, real-world example. So we say a dog in an ambulance, and an ambulance drives by a house with its sirens on. You know the I'm sure we've all experienced that. Maybe it's woken us up at night. I used to, you know, I was, when I, I lived in my apartment in New York City on a very busy street, I was woken up by ambulances all the time. Uh, but uh, we can imagine this ambulance drives by a house and there's a dog in the yard and the dog, you know, wakes up and barks at the, at the ambulance. And we can ask the causal question in a very straightforward way. Did the ambulance driving by the house cause the dog to bark? And then we can reframe that in terms of a counterfactual and say, would the dog have barked if the ambulance had not driven by the house? And so th in that framing of the question, we're thinking about this kind of alternate reality, this other universe where everything else is the same, except that this ambulance didn't drive by this house. Uh, perhaps it took a different street in this parallel universe. Um, and we want to ask, would this dog still have barked? Because if the dog would have barked regardless of the ambulance, uh, then the ambulance probably didn't cause it to bark. But if the dog didn't bark because there was no ambulance, then we can 
maybe make the assumption or, or feel more confident that this ambulance is causing the dog to barking. Uh, of course, this is a lot of words. We like to simplify things, make an easy diagram, right? Rather than having to, to write a whole paragraph about dogs barking. Uh, and we can visualize this relationship with what's called a causal diag diagram. Uh, you also see them called a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, this is different from a dog, a DAG and a dog, but uh, this is a DAG, which, uh, so when we have uh, a DAG, we uh, start with our exposure, uh, which is um, here, uh, the ambulance driving by, which causes the dog to bark. Uh, and so this is the, the theoretical causal relationship that, that we would want to test in this hypothetical example. You know, is, is this theoretical model of the ambulance causing the dog to bark true? And we depict that by showing there's an arrow. So, uh, some of the properties of a directed acyclic graph, graph is they have to be directed. That means uh, you have to have an arrow. You can't have a line. You can't have you know, an arrow pointing both ways. It has to point in a certain direction because we are saying you know, the ambulance causes the dog to bark. Uh, and they are acyclic. So one event happens after the other. So we can't have an arrow uh, you know, going back towards from dog barking to the ambulance uh, because, you know, the time has passed, you know, this happens in one direction. There's not a cycle going on where we get this feedback loop of the ambulance and the dog barking. Um, this is because of the, the passage of time. You could have something where potentially maybe the dog barking causes, you know, I don't know, someone else to call for another ambulance somehow. And then, but you would depict that by putting a second ambulance in here. You wouldn't do another arrow back to the original ambulance. Um, so this example that I've given here it is the simplest form of a causal diagram. Uh, so we've got an exposure and we have an outcome and we've got a link between the two, showing the causal relationship that we hypothesize to be true. Um, however, um, this may not be true once we actually test this. And so uh, in chat again, can you think of any situations where we might observe this relationship where an ambulance drives by and a dog barks, uh, but th that relationship is not causal. There's, there's something else going on. Uh, yeah, Crystal says some posterior event, like the dog seeing another dog that the data doesn't capture. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, that perfect answer. Like, there's a lurking third variable that that is caught that is causing the dog to bark. Uh, we we could imagine, for instance, uh, I, the one I like to think of is like a, a a car crash. So maybe there was a a car crash that happened, which that caused the dog to start barking. Uh, but the ambulance is responding to that car crash. And so we just observe the ambulance and the dog barking, not having heard the initial car crash, but the car crash caused both the ambulance and the dog barking barking to occur. Uh, and so uh, that was a great answer. Um, so yeah, there can be, this relationship is not ever this simple, unfortunately, for our, for our purposes, it can be very complicated. Um, and so I thought we would, would take a moment and actually try making some DAGs. So um, there, there are several options for making DAGs. We can draw them by hand on a piece of paper, um, but uh, or use just like a, a software that's meant for making flowcharts or diagrams. For instance, you could do this in PowerPoint or Word or um, you know, one of those online tools, like I think there's like flow.io, uh, but there are also specialized tools available online and they 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 give us some things that we can do in R uh, that, that are really helpful. So I'm going to show you one of these, it's called Daggity. This is the one that I know, know probably the best. Uh, I think there might be some other options out here, but I'll focus on this one. I'll put a link to it in chat. Um, 
Daggity is really nice because it offers an online version where we can, with a user interface, we, we can build our DAG and then we can export that to R. Uh, so I will show you here in Daggity. Uh, this is the website. Uh, there is an offline version. Uh, there They talk about their R package, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, but what we're interested in right now is this online uh, version. So if we launch it, um, we get something that looks like this. Uh, it, this is just their, their kind of default model, but we're going to make our own model. Um, so we'll, we'll just go up here to model to new model. Um, and now we just have this, this blank screen. Um, and so we want to add variables. And we can just add a variable by, by clicking on the gray screen. And we'll say, uh, we'll just stick with our smoking and lung cancer example. Uh, so we'll say like smoking. Uh, that's one of our variables. The other variable is lung cancer. And we propose that there is a relationship between them. We, we are pretty sure, I think, at this point that smoking causes lung cancer. And so to add that relationship, we just click on smoking uh, and click on lung cancer after that. And it will make an arrow to them. If you accidentally, uh, whoops, if you accidentally make the arrow the wrong way, uh, let's say you accidentally do it like this, you just click on the right way, I think a couple times, and it, it will uh, it will fix it. Um, notice that we have not specified either as the exposure or the outcome. We can do that by clicking on the variable. And then you can see our variable up here in the upper left corner. And we can say, this is our exposure. Uh, and then we can click on our outcome variable here and say, this is our outcome. <clears throat> And you will notice uh, that we get this summer, summary in the lower right corner. It says our exposure is smoking. Our outcome is lung cancer. Uh, we haven't added any other variables to the model. So we have zero covariates. And we have one causal pathway, which is the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Uh, and now we can add uh, our third variable. So let's think about R.A. Fisher, who, who proposed that there was some kind of genetic component. So we can say, you know, there, there's a genetic component, and he argued that caused both people to smoke. Uh, so we put an arrow from genetics to smoking by clicking on them both, and he believed that also caused people to develop lung cancer. <clears throat> so now we have added this third variable uh, to our model, um, and we we see now that there is a a covariate here. Uh, so uh, now let's say we uh, we've made this um, diagram and we we want to take this into R now. We've we've let's say this is you know our our hypothesis that we are testing to see if this genetic factor would explain the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. We have this this model code here on the right. Um, and we can just copy that. Uh, and if we go into R, uh, whoops, I didn't copy. Perfect. Okay, there's a library called Daggity, which you can install off the CRAN. Um, D A G I T T Y. Uh, and using that library, we can uh, use the command uh, daggity. Uh, and then we just paste our uh, our dag in there. Uh, we have to. Chloe, please, yep. uh, can you make your screen a little bit? Oh, bigger? yes. Sorry. Sorry. Because it's really small. There we go. OK. Sorry. So, so sorry about that. I always forget. God, I have to remember that. I never remember to make my screen bigger. Um, it's okay. Now it's okay. Yep. Uh, so the, the only thing we have to do is take out the, these position coordinates. Uh, they don't seem to play nicely with, uh, with the R version of this. Uh, but once we take those out, it should be fine. Um, right. And it, it's annoyed. Be, it's going to put these quotation marks around lung cancer. So we can just make lung cancer into one. Word, take out the quotation marks, just to keep things simple. Uh, and I think we can take 
this out. Um, and so, so we, we have a very, it's our model here. We can still see that it's a pretty uh, straightforward, easy way to read it. It still says that there's smoking, you know, we believe it causes lung cancer and there's this genetic component that is, potentially causes lung cancer and causes smoking. Um, let me remember how to do this. Uh, yep, so we can uh, just run this. I believe, oh, I think I have to plot it. One second. Right, I have to plot it, okay. Cool, uh, so we get a plot. Uh, it's not necessarily the most beautiful thing uh, yet. Uh, it's a little weird. In fact, we see that smoking is over here, lung cancer is over here. Ideally, we'd probably want it to read left to right, um, you know, uh, exposure to outcome. Uh, but we see that that it, it has captured the relationship. Um, so uh, you can actually play around with this quite a bit. You can, uh, there's additional uh, uh, things you can do to specify, uh, you know, the, the coordinates of each variable and to uh, generally make it a, a bit more beautiful uh, using Daggety directly. But what I prefer to use um, is actually ggdag. Uh, and ggdag is really nice because it allows you to use uh, ggplot uh, style, um, style language when, when making your plot. Uh, so it's again on the CRAN as uh, ggdag. Uh, and then what we can do is take our daggety object, we'll just save it here. Uh, and then we just do ggdag. And if we give it that object, we you can see we get a very, uh, very ggplot looking diagram. Yeah, and I'll put this in chat, by the way. Um, and so, and then we can we can beautify it a bit, which is uh, what I, I've done in this example here. I added a few more variables, such as pollution and age. Uh, and then you can adjust, you know, the size of the circles. You can change the text color. You can turn off the theme. Um, so there, there's a lot of options here. It's just like working with any ggplot. Uh, so that's really nice. So that allows us to make a, a, a nice, beautiful diagram um, and play around with it, make sure it looks better uh, rather than everything being all over the place like it was in that first one I made. Um, and so that that's how you make a, a DAG in R. And so why why do you make a DAG, I think is the question that, that then emerges from this. And the, the answer is we want to these relationships can get pretty complicated. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, Crystal says those are beautiful. Um, you can make you can make them much more beautiful. If, as with everything in ggplot, you can make them even more beautiful if you spend, you know, if you can deep dive in this for hours and make them absolutely perfect. But I just wanted to show that you can pretty quickly make these. Um, yeah. So uh, these relationships can be pretty complicated because. We can think of, you know, obviously with smoking and lung cancer, there, there's a pretty simple relationship there, but there's a lot of other variables that come into play, right? Not everyone who smokes develops lung cancer, so there must be other variables like genetics, potentially some kind of environmental pollution exposure, age seems to be important, There might and there might be other factors, potentially maybe diet affects whether you develop lung cancer. And potentially, you know, there's a ton of other variables we could add to this model. And so our DAG could get pretty complicated. We could have a dozen or more variables in our in our DAG with arrows pointing all over the place. And even as complicated as that DAG gets, it's less complicated than trying to explain all the relationships and words, which would probably take you know, pages of writing, well, you know, we believe that genetics causes smoking and it also causes lung cancer. And, and it's much simpler to just, you know, make this this diagram. 
Um, and so uh, those are DAGs. Uh, by the way, if there's any questions, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, feel free to drop them in chat. I have it up on my other window so I can, I can see. Um, uh, so next we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about some of the uh, relationships that we will observe in a DAG and why they're important, what they mean, and uh, how do we account for them in causal inference. Um, and so the first we're gonna talk about is, is confounding. And so uh, you've probably heard the term confounder. It, it's pretty common, I think, in a lot of uh, uh, research. Um, but uh, there is there's a very uh, strict definition of what a confounder actually is, and it's in terms of causal inference. So a confounder has to cause the outcome, a confounder has to cause the exposure, and the confounder is not a mediator. It's not present on the causal pathway between the exposure and the outcome. So again, returning to our example of the ambulance and the barking dog, this could be confounded by a third variable, which I mentioned, the car crash. And the car crash is causing both the ambulance to be in the area and the dog to bark. And so this car crash, you know, when the ambulance, uh, the dog started barking before the ambulance even arrived, the ambulance could cause the dog to bark even more, right? That just because this car crash caused the dog to start barking, it doesn't necessarily mean the ambulance isn't causing the dog to bark more. It just might be that the relationship we see between the ambulance and the dog barking, if we don't consider the car crash, um, we think that ambulances cause the dog to start barking a lot more. To, again, put this back into a more you know, health and bioinformatics oriented example, we might say, um, you know, we observe a certain effect of smoking on lung cancer, but there's also, a genetic component. Uh, it probably, again, does not explain all of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, but it might explain a small part of it. And so if we don't think about the effect that that genetic component is having on the observed relationship, then we might get a biased relationship. And so uh, this pathway that, we, that we've created uh, that goes between the ambulance, the car crash, and the dog barking is what we call a backdoor pathway. Uh, that is because it influences the effect we see uh, in the primary pathway of interest if we don't if we don't do something about it. it it will create bias and it might make the effect um, more pronounced. You might see a larger effect than is true in reality or it might uh, bias it uh, towards the null and make make the relationship uh, smaller. Um, so you could think of a variable uh, that that maybe there's something that causes the ambulance to be quieter and also causes the dog to stop barking um, would be the case here. Um, so um, how do we approach this problem? We've got this extra variable that is causing bias. Well, uh, we can do what's called deconfounding, and many of you have probably already done this. You've probably done a, a, a regression model where you've entered uh, covariates, you know, you've got your primary relationship of interest, but then you add extra variables. Often this would be something like um, demographic variables. So for instance, uh, you know, you might add age or race or sex, um, you know, as uh, covariates in, in this model between the exposure and your outcome of interest. And by adding these in, in your model, you are, uh, you know, effectively stratifying uh, the effect of the exposure on the outcome across different levels of the confounder. Um, and this allows you to get an effect size when adjusted for that confounder. And that's effectively deconfounding. If you didn't want to do this, um, in a um, regression model, you could also just manually stratify your data. This is, you know, how how they the used to do with deal with confounding in uh, before regression was, uh, you know, easily done on any personal computer. Uh, so you, in that case, you might, if you think age um, uh, is a confounder of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, you would divide the data into age groups. 
and then look at the effect of smoking on lung cancer in each age group. And in that way, you've effectively adjusted for that confounder or deconfounded. Um, so uh, we come to exercise one. Uh, so in R or using, you know, Daggety, the online version, or, or if you want to just try your hand on, on writing it directly into R, um, create a, a DAG for a causal relationship of interest to you. Uh, and be sure to include at least one confounder or one possible confounder. And uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to know for sure that's a confounder, just something that you think might be a confounder. Uh, and then if you want to, to briefly maybe write a sentence about the relationship of interest and what you, you believe to be a confounder um, of that relationship, and I will, I will do the same So while, while we work. Oh, and I can make this a little bigger. <laughs> And yeah, let me just put like an example of what I'm looking for in chat. And any brave souls out there willing to share willing to share what what they looked at? Give you another another few seconds. Okay, well, I, uh, oh, uh, Gabriella says sources of antibiotic resistance genes, sewage, hospitals, agriculture. Uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's a great example. So, so um, what might cause bacteria to develop antibiotic resistance and, and what are the sources of those? So, uh, yeah, I, I can picture that, that DAG. Um, 
Thank you for sharing. Uh, anyone else? If not, I, I will talk through my example a bit and what I'm, I'm thinking about. So um, I'm thinking about antibiotics and their, their effect on the gut microbiome. Uh, and, and I believe this relationship is, oh, perfect. Here's one from Fatima, uh, effective pandemic on mental health. And can it be confounded by factors such as losing a job? Uh, yeah, this, this is a great example uh, where, uh, yeah, we can imagine that, you know, we've got this pandemic that we're living in uh, and that uh, that has a toll that causes, you know, some mental health tolls. I think I've seen some research recently that said like 25% of Americans right now are either depressed or have symptoms of anxiety, uh, which is not surprising. Um, and it can be confounded. So like if a person loses their job, that can both affect how they perceive the pandemic and it can also affect, you know, their, their mental health. Uh, and how vulnerable they are, I guess, to, to the pandemic in general. So that's a good example too, Fatima, thank you. Um, so, and then in my model here, I'm interested in antibiotics and gut microbiome. And I said, well, age is probably a confounder of that. You know, people are more likely to be on antibiotics, I think at a young age and also as they get older, uh, there's health status, you know, people who are, who are um, sicker, maybe they have got a chronic condition such as diabetes uh, that can both affect uh, whether they're on antibiotics and their gut microbiome. And then finally, diet uh, always seems to be important when it comes to microbiome. Um, and I could see a, a situation where uh, that might affect uh, whether you need antibiotic treatment or not. Uh, there could be, and, and the important part here is to think about, this doesn't have to be a direct cause of, of antibiotics. So even though diet may be uh, is several steps removed. Maybe it, it causes someone to have a poor immune system functioning because all they they only eat junk food, and that causes them to be on antibiotics. So this arrow doesn't have to be a direct relationship. There could be several intermediary variables. There could be an, a huge number of them. In fact, um, just as in the case of of you know smoking and lung cancer you know, th there's a lot of different variables. The smoke has to get into the lungs. The smoke has to, to damage, uh, you know, the lung tissue. And then we could even break that down further and say like, okay, what does it mean when it's damaging the lung tissue? And really just break it down into very small atomistic parts or if that's important to us. So that, that is the question that we have to ask, you know, am I interested in thinking about each of those small components that make up this arrow that, that I have created? Or am I okay just thinking about, you know, it as a, a big picture? And ideally, you know, we, we would consider things discreetly as much as possible. Don't think it's as important just showing the bigger picture right now. Uh, but as I think about this, you can also think about how there, whoops, there might be other relationship here. So this relationship can get quite complicated because we can think that we, you know, age impacts diet. And so we actually have an arrow going uh, there. Uh, and age also health status. And maybe that's the primary relationship. If I deconfound for health status, I, I have blocked that path. So I don't need to adjust for diet if I'm adjusting for health status. But I still need to adjust for age because age has uh, an arrow antibiotics. And so you can see that this gets pretty complicated trying to think through what's blocked and what's unblocked. And this is why using software is really important because you know if we added just a few more variables in here, um, it, it, it and just drew more arrows, it would get quite complicated. And rather than trying 
for us to sit there and, and puzzle this out and follow the arrows. What we can do is just have the software do this, do this for us. And I'll, I'll actually show you how you can do this in R directly. You don't even have to necessarily go to Daggety to do that in a moment. Um, but that's confounding. Um, that's just one source of, of bias. There are other sources as well. Um, there are colliders. Um, so uh, when we take it at face value, colliders look very similar to confounders. Uh, but colliders are not uh, causes of the exposure and outcomes. In fact, they're the opposite. They're effects of the exposure and the outcome. That is to say, the exposure uh, and the outcome cause the collider. So uh, whereas before, uh, in our example with the ambulance and the dog, we saw this car crash, we saw the arrows are pointing towards both the ambulance and the dog barking from car crash. And this example here of a collider, we've now added uh, a, a collider variable, which is sleep disruption. So the ambulance going by and the dog barking wakes us up. Um, and those both cause us to be, you know, the ambulance and the dog barking cause us to be, our sleep to be disrupted. And so in this case, this is very important to think about is that that they they are not, sleep disruption does not cause the ambulance to drive by and it does not cause the dog to bark. Um, and, and an example, uh, again, to, to go back to like an actual health example, uh, you might think about, um, Can, oh, sorry, I just saw that there's a question. Uh, can we import external data set onto this uh, on Daggety? Um, that's a good question. Uh, no, I don't think you can. It, uh, the idea, I think, uh, often is that, that um, you're doing this, this is kind of theoretical, but you believe the causal relationship to be. Uh, you could probably, in, in R, use variables fr from your data set. Uh, as you create a DAG in R, but um, generally speaking, this is kind of just a theoretical approach, and then and then you try and design a model to test this with your data. Um, yeah, but we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more in R in a second. That's actually a really excellent question. Um, anyways, sorry to interrupt myself, but getting back into colliders. Uh, so the issue here is if we adjust for a collider, like we would a confounder, uh, by by including it in our regression model, we are introducing bias because this collider, uh, the pathway uh, is already blocked. And so if we adjust for a variable that we already, uh, you know, that, that isn't confounding this relationship, we are introducing bias. And that is important because Obviously, we don't want to introduce bias, but it also means when we add confounders to our model, we need to think about, is this actually a confounder or is this a collider? And so thinking about smoking and lung cancer, uh, we could imagine both of those variables maybe cause hospitalization, but hospitalization does not cause someone to smoke, nor does it cause someone to develop lung cancer. So in that model, in that case, if we adjusted for hospitalization and said people who, who are hospitalized, you know, we're going to uh, adjust for that, we might be introducing bias to the observed relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Um, so just a side note on pathways, real quick: uh, a pathway is considered block, blocked. Uh, that means the pathway is closed or it's not influencing the observed relationship. If there are, if there are two arrow, arrows pointing into each other along the path, as is the case of a collider, so if we see in sleep disruption, we see these two arrows pointing into each other, that pathway is blocked. If two arrows point at each other, it's blocked. Or if you have deconfounded, that is controlled, stratified, or adjusted for a variable in the pathway. So, um, in the example here on the left, um, this this pathway uh, between uh, the exposure and outcome through C1, C2 uh, is not blocked. We don't see any arrows pointing at each other. In the example on the right here, this pathway is blocked though, because there are two arrows pointing at each other at C1 and C2. And so this affects how we model this relationship. If we 
were uh, modeling the relationship on the left, we'd have to adjust for either C1 or C2. We wouldn't need to adjust for both. Adjusting for one would be sufficient to block it, which you can make the diagram in Diagity if you don't believe me and try it out for yourself. Uh, but in, in the second example on the right, uh, we don't need to adjust for C1 or C2 because the pathway is blocked due to these, uh, these arrows that are hitting each other at C2. Uh, so uh, for exercise two, try adding a collider to the DAG that, that you've made. And I, I will add one as well. And if anyone wants to drop what, um, uh, what they think is a, a confounder into, into chat, uh, or not a confounder, a collider, excuse me, into chat, uh, feel free to. But I, I think I'll just move forward and, and talk about this. Uh, so uh, what I think would be a collider between this relationship here would be gastrointestinal symptoms. You know, antibiotics could cause you have some gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, that's probably primarily due to changes in the gut microbiome, but Potentially, there's some other pathways by which that, that could have effects. Maybe it causes a little inflammation uh, or, or gives you an upset stomach or, or something just without affecting your gut microbiome in some way. I'm not sure, but that could potentially be a collider here. And so I don't want to adjust for that. You know, if I'm modeling this effect on antibiotics and gut microbiome, I don't want to adjust for gastrointestinal symptoms or else I will introduce bias instead of remove it. Um, so that that is a collider. Um, you might be asking, okay, well, why is this important? It, it doesn't impact my relationship. I don't need to identify colliders um, that if it's not going to affect the relationship I'm observing. And that's, uh, that, that's true on the surface, but a problem that emerges from colliders is a problem called selection bias. Uh, and this is when uh, we have a research study and your selection into that research study uh, is dependent on the exposure and the outcome in the study. Uh, and so that is that is a collider. So we can imagine selection being something that uh, is caused by both the exposure and the outcome. Um, I, you often see this in studies of um, groups such as, uh, uh, you know, like uh, miners or, or uh, factory workers where you have a condition. So let's say like you've got uh, coal mine workers uh, who uh, develop emphysema. Well, uh, if they get sick from emphysema, they might, you know, quit their job because they're sick uh, and, and leave, you know, the mine. And therefore, when I go there to do my study of you know, coal miners with emphysema, I find, oh, well, none of these coal miners have emphysema. A and the reason for that is because all of them left the job when they got sick. Um, so so one faculty member that, that I've had calls this the, the already dead problem because uh, people who have already died of the, the relationship that you're interested in are not alive to be in your study. Um, and these people might have a more aggressive or serious form of the outcome. And uh, by not including them, we're biasing this observed causal relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Another common source of selection bias in research studies will be loss to follow up. So if you're doing a longitudinal study, um, this can often happen when people drop out uh, differentially between different groups. So if we were doing a study of, let's say, um, let's say uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 
and microbiome. Um, we can imagine, you know, that if we don't have a good mechanism for for finding out that participants, you know, died uh, over time, uh, we're hoping that they come to the same hospital or that they you know, that their family self-report or something. If we don't have a mechanism for identifying that, we might lose out on the people who, who have passed away. Um, and, and that loss to follow-up will introduce selection bias as well. And so another way of thinking about selection bias is we can say that, that we have inadvertently, we don't know that we did this, we don't purposely do this, but we have inadvertently uh, conditioned on a collider is what they called it, or or you have used this collider to select participants, and you you didn't realize that you did this. Um, an, another very classic example of this, just to give more, because I know it can be hard to think through, um, it, it actually comes from um, the U.S. military. Uh, actually try to deploy a new surgical technique to improve surgical outcomes in soldiers who had been wounded uh, in, in combat. Uh, and when they, when they did this study, they found this surgical outcome had a way higher chance of, of death compared to people who, who got the conventional treatment. Uh, and, and then they looked into it further and discovered that actually, the people who they were selecting for the surgical outcome were the people who were the most likely to die anyway because they were more seriously wounded. And so they had inadvertently conditioned on a collider uh, and that had introduced selection bias and therefore they had observed the, the a relationship where this, this surgery didn't work even though potentially it, it, it did, it just, they were, testing it on a different group than they thought they were. Um, and, and that's selection bias. And we can talk about that a bit more. I know, I know it's very complicated. And you know, you can take whole classes that's that can spend a whole semester talking about selection bias. So if you're interested, I, I will have more resources also at the end to, where you can learn more about this. Uh, so any questions, because we're going to switch gears a bit. Uh, to briefly talk about study designs, and then, then I, this is a, this is a workshop. We will be doing some more uh, actual work in R uh, in a little bit. I promise. Okay. Well, uh, see no questions. I will start talking about study design. Um, so it's really important now that we have this framing of, of causal inference uh, to think about the studies that we run. Uh, you know, there's there's two major types of studies that that we run uh, in bioinformatics as well as in public health and in, in most fields, which are you know experimental designs and observational designs. So experimental designs, of course, are the, the big one will be randomized control trials. Um, again, not to, to, to talk too much about this, because I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these, uh, but the exposure is assigned at random. You know, we, we assign people, we say, you're getting drug A, you're getting the placebo, or, uh, you know, we're saying, uh, we're going to give these people, uh, you know, this diet and these people will eat a conventional diet, you know, something like that. Um, and because that exposure is assigned at random, there are no possible confounders of the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Uh, and just, we can think through that because if, if that exposure status is random, there is no way that any variable can point towards it, well, aside from our randomizer. So there is no confounders. There's no possible way that a uh, if the randomization was done correctly that that we have a confounder of both the ex that is causal of both the exposure and the outcome. And that's the big benefit of these experimental, you know, RCTs is because um, they they are they are capable of, of blocking this pathway uh, and preventing any confounding. And that's really important because often uh, there are confounders that we don't know about. You know, we never know everything about the relationship. And so being able to block confounders, whether we've measured them or not, whether we know about them or not, is the, the, the 
most powerful thing about RCTs. Uh, and that is why, you know, uh, if you, if you, uh, m many people are just taught that this is the only way you can prove something is causal is using an RCT. But selection bias is still possible in these studies. So, so you could observe uh, a causal relationship where there isn't one or, or that could bias things so that you don't observe a causal relationship where there is one. Uh, so just a quick question, if you can drop an answer in chat, if, if you can figure it out, where can selection bias occur in an RCT? Or when can selection bias occur in an RCT, I mean? <laughs> Give you 10 more seconds if anyone wants to take a guess. No wrong answers. This is a workshop. Uh, Jan Janelle uh, says maybe the type of treatment. I, I think you're getting there. Um, I, I yeah, yeah. So imagine if we had a treatment that um, that that caused certain people to have maybe really bad symptoms. Like we give them some kind of treatment, some new drug, and, and they get really bad side effects, and they don't like it, and they stop taking it, and they drop out of the study. And that might introduce selection bias. When we have this differential loss to follow-up between the exposed or treatment group and the placebo group. And that is where we, we observe um, selection bias. And in that case, the people who've uh, selected themselves uh, to, to to continue, you know, taking the drug of interest or the treatment of interest are, are people who the side effects maybe were more bearable for or, or were more dedicated to the study. And therefore you have condition on this collider of side effects. Uh, and that's where selection bias uh, emerges. And we've got a few other ones, not randomizing samples. Yeah, so if randomization fails uh, for whatever reason, which uh, can happen, um, that that can happen uh, due to uh, you know potentially you know there there's some protocol error that could introduce some form of bias. Um, people who are more interested in health could participate in the study. Uh, yeah, that that's kind of yeah. Th there could be some uh, differences at baseline that wouldn't introduce any confounding, but it could be uh, it could result in your population in the trial being very different from the population of interest in the general population. Um, so, you know, your sample differs from the population in such a way that maybe the results aren't generalizable. Um, uh, I'm, I'll drop the link to the GitHub in chat because, uh, yeah, so, I, I, and Crystal says, uh, when they survey reviews of movies in Hollywood, everyone is pretty movie savvy there. Yeah, so so that, that, that that's getting more into like a generalizability or transportability question where we think about the external validity of our results, where we think, okay, well, if I do a survey of, you know, uh, let's say some very like artsy movie in Hollywood, those people love movies, they see a lot of movies, maybe they have a different taste of movies than like if we go to, I don't know, just some people in in, in somewhere else in, in the world and maybe those people like action movies or superhero movies more and, and but the people in Hollywood, you know, prefer more artsy and intellectual movies. So that that's more of a question of external validity of how valid our results are to an external population. Um, so, but we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. So that's a good point. Um, so uh, j just to mention also uh, some other study designs that we see pretty commonly are instrumental variable analyses or or Mendelian randomization, as it's often referred to uh, when you have a, a gene as a as a randomizer. Um, in the, these studies, you have kind of this source of pseudo randomization. Um, Whereas uh, where in like an uh, Mendelian randomization in MR, we imagine that there's kind of a randomly distributed genetic variation, uh, which serves as, as our randomizer. Uh, and 
that we can mimic an, uh, an RCT with, even though we couldn't ethically do it. And so you, you will see that in uh, some studies, I think of, of uh, I, I think I saw one recently of like breastfeeding and childhood obesity, where they looked at certain genes that affect, uh, I think like milk production in women as kind of their pseudo randomizer for whether the babies were breastfed or not which would be the exposure, and then the outcome was childhood obesity. Um, and then, uh, yeah, th there's other examples that, that, that are you commonly used for, for these types of studies, such as distance to a medical center uh, and, before and before and after implementation of a new policy. Um, that one's pretty common. You'll see that in more in public health studies than bioinformatics, but uh, it is possible. Um, but then we get into the observational studies. So the major ones that we will observe are a cohort study. Um, cohort studies tend to be a participants are chosen on a common characteristic. Um, the, the classic example of this would be the uh, Framingham Heart Study, uh, which is uh, a the the town of Framingham, Massachusetts, here in the United States. Uh, they basically followed the whole town to see um, what heart uh, conditions they develop over time. Um, and uh, but there's other studies. There are large studies of like doctors and nurses uh, where they're recruited at, when they enroll in med school and then followed throughout their entire lives to see what conditions they deliver they develop or it could be you know history of particular disease uh, so there will be cohort studies of people you know with a history of um let's say like substance abuse and you follow up with them over time to see what exposures and outcomes you can assess um as of all observational studies both selection bias and confounding can occur selection bias because loss to follow-up as well as because you know the people who enroll in the study uh, might be different from the people who who would be eligible for the study if we could include everyone, including people who maybe died or moved away. Um, and confounding can occur because we have not randomized the exposures. We're just seeing what exposures they develop or have and what outcomes they have. So confounding can occur as, as well. Uh, another major type you, you will see very frequently in microbiome, and I think uh, 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 so, some uh, genomics work as well, is a case control study. Uh, you often select participants who have an outcome of interest. So this would be if we selected, say, like 40 people with diabetes, and then you try and match them to similar people. You try and find people who are very similar. Um, so you would say, okay, I've got 40 people with diabetes. Let me find 40 people who are similar in age and sex and other demographic variables to this 40, um, and we'll match them. We'll we'll say, okay, this person is you know 35 years old. They are female, and uh, you know they they uh, are you know. Uh, African American. Let's find someone who has those same characteristics and we'll match them. The idea being hopefully that those people are similar uh, enough that that there aren't a ton of confounders. This is not true. We can't match on everything. We can't find everything perfectly. Uh, so there still can be selection bias and confounding. Um, probably the ultimate example of like a case control study that you'll see a lot is a twin study. The idea being that if you have an identical twin, hopefully they're very, very similar to you. You know, they hopefully were raised in the same household, therefore enjoy similar food. They're the same age. You know, they, they're really matched to you. And so th that's, that's just an example of a case control study where you've matched on as much as you can, but twins still differ. They, you know, th they're not the same person. They can have still differences. So there's still possibility for confounding. Um, and finally, I just want to mention that genome-wide association studies, GWASs, are very common in bioinformatics and are a type of observational study. Uh, and uh, you know, you you can do them as cohort studies or as case control studies. Um, and uh, yeah, they, there are still sources of potential confounding or bias in, in a GWAS. Um, I'm not going to. There is a question of like where the sources are, but I just want to keep moving forward. So um, we can talk about uh, we can talk about that at the end if we have time. 
Um, so what I really want to get into uh, a bit more now is things you can do in R. Um, rather than just me telling you that there's all these problems and that uh, you have to think about them, let's talk about what you can do in R. Well, as I mentioned, we can make our DAGs in R either by exporting them from Dagity uh, and then pasting them into R, or we can make them directly by you know, specifying the, this Dagity object with uh, arrows pointing to our variables of interest. So I've just done an example here um, and then plotted it. So we've got you know, our exposure X and our outcome Y, and then I just put a bunch of arrows in there. Uh, but what's nice is we we have this actually, you know, this is this is an R and and uh, Daggety can solve for us and tell us what we need to adjust for, uh, rather than us having to sit there and like look at the arrows and you know think it through like, okay, well is this pathway blocked? I'm not sure. Why do that when you know? It can tell us for us, uh, and so what we can do is is run this this code here. Um, this is this is still on GitHub, by the way, and, and I'll show you an, a simpler version of this in a moment. But uh, we can say, okay, tell me all the things, all the different ways we can adjust for the relationships to get the effect of x on y. And so we go here, it tells us a bunch of different ones for all the different variables, but we're interested in the effect of x on y, and it says. Okay, you can identify the total effect of X on Y by controlling for W2 and Z2, or you can get it by adjusting for V and W2, or V and W1, or W1 and Z1. So there's multiple ways to observe that effect. And why is that important? Well, some of these variables we might not have data for, like potentially maybe we didn't measure them, we didn't realize it would be important, or it's hard to measure. It's something uh, that uh, you know you, you can't get from participants' medical records, or maybe it's something that is very intrusive, and you know it, it would require like a blood draw or, or some complicated procedure that you don't want to do. Um, and and so we have options, and and that's important to note is that if we've got a even in a complicated situation like this, there might be different ways to adjust for it. And so that's what this is really helpful for, is seeing that oh, we don't have to adjust for every variable, and there are some options for us. But rather than you know running the, this block of code, uh, ggdag actually has a nice little function where we give it our DAG. So that's just that, that DAG object from up above, G1. Um, and then we tell it our exposure and we tell it our outcome. And it tells us the different, and it gives us this nice little plot of all the different adjustment sets we could use. So we can see this corresponds to the, the answer we got above. And it tells us, OK, we can adjust for V and W1. Uh, and it flags them in red for us, which is nice. Um, or we can adjust for V and W2, et cetera. And so it's giving us the same results as above, but we don't have to write run this whole you know, for statement. Um, we just run this, this single line of code and give it the exposure and the outcome. And we get this nice little thing that says, OK, when I run a regression model of you know, the effect of X on Y, I will adjust for, let's say, V and W1. And I will have sufficiently adjusted uh, to to block the backdoor pathways between any potential confounders. Uh, so yeah, the, it's actually pretty straightforward. The, the hard part is developing the DAG itself. Once you have that DAG, uh, then I think it, it follows that, that from there, you could actually identify what you need to adjust for pretty easily. And uh, when developing DAGs, uh, you know, there are things that we can't measure, as I mentioned, and there are things that we won't have data for. And I think that's important. It's just that we have to acknowledge the fact that that we don't ha know everything and that we don't have all the data. And um, that that's okay. And that that's, you know, something that you put in your limitations section, right? You say like, well, you know, I think that there could probably be unmeasured confounding. Um, there could be unmeasured confounding by, you know, this, uh, variable that I haven't measured, uh, and then you could potentially talk about how you think it might affect what you observe. Um, so now that we've identified, you know, our uh, variables that we can adjust for, uh, you can specify uh, just in commonly used uh, uh, 
uh, bioinformatics packages, you know, you can specify in the model what you want to adjust for. So for instance, we'll do an example of this in just, a, or we'll work on this together in just a moment, but uh, you can specify in DE seq 2 you know, confounders as part of your uh, design statement. And EDGAR and LIMA, you can specify as part of your model statement uh, that, that you've got a, a confounder, which would be this batch. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to switch over to actually the, the workshop portion of this workshop. Uh, so I thought uh, we've uh, Levi, who uh, Waldron, who is my uh, dissertation mentor, has this excellent software package uh, in Bioconductor uh, called Curated Metagenomic Data. Um, it has a bunch of already cleaned and ready to go um, uh, microbiome data sets. So I figured we would use that. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a data set in there called uh, Evokman E2016. Uh, this data set has 52 cases of colorectal cancer and 52 controls. It is a case control study. Uh, and I thought uh, we could just use this. Uh, so, uh, or if you prefer, while we work on this, to use your own data if you've got something ready that you would like to, to work on. Uh, so we are interested on in the exposure, uh, which is colorectal cancer, and whether that uh, changes the gut microbiome. So that's our outcome, the gut microbiome. So uh, step one Hello? is to- no, oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, can you uh, make it bigger? Uh, and oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's good now. I've got I've got this big monitor and I, I always forget that people can be on small laptop screens and it's small. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll start by making a DAG um, and then uh, consider possible confounders, maybe colliders that could introduce selection bias. Uh, and then using this DAG, determine what to adjust for. Um, and I, I will kind of are now and I'll, I'll start running through this, but if you uh, want to work along with me uh, or if you just want to follow along, you know, it, it is in the, um, in, in the, uh, yeah, in, in the GitHub repo, uh, in the vignette, uh, if you want to follow along there or if you want to follow along with me. So the first step is, installing curated metagenomic data. Uh, here, I'll switch over, um, which is this statement up here. Um, but, uh, and then loading the packages that we need. Uh, and so I'm going to make uh, a DAG. It's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, so my exposure uh, of interest here is, you know, d does um, colorectal cancer cause changes in the microbiome? And, you know, I am taking a pretty big shorthand here because I know the microbiome is, is very complicated. You know, there's a variety of, of different taxa uh, and there could potentially be different relationships. It's not homogenous, uh, but shortcutting a little here. Uh, and that's something to think through. Like, you have to use your own uh, knowledge of of what you're interested in, and think through like, what do I know about this relationship? Um, as you think through what your DAG should look like, um, and I'm assuming that there, there's probably two major confounders right away: probably age and gender. So I enter those as confounders. Uh, there could be other confounders as well. So we could imagine uh, diet confounding this relationship. Um, oh, no, not diet to diet, diet to microbiome. Uh, we could imagine, you know, general health status also confounding this relationship, uh, you know, health issues other than colorectal cancers. And so uh, using that, uh, we can uh, then make our DAG. It's a little, weird looking because uh, we would need to play with it a little bit so that uh, it looks a little more straightforward, but we can see we've got colorectal cancer here, causing microbiome, and we have a bunch of different confounders, uh, health status, gender, age, diet. Um, and we could also add a uh, collider here. So 
uh, I'm thinking about what might be a collider of this relationship. Um, I mean, we, we could imagine that hospitalization is a collider here. Uh, maybe people that uh, have uh, colorectal cancer are more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, and then maybe colorectal cancer also causes changes in the microbiome, which then affects severity of symptoms, which also affects hospitalization. Uh, so that would be a collider in that, that example. Uh, and so again, we've changed our model and added this, this hospitalization variable. And there should be an arrow from microbiome to hospitalization. I think it's just covered up right now. Um, and so now that we, we've created this DAG, we can say, okay, you know, I, I've got uh, my DAG. Uh, it's stored as this object called VDAG. Um, and I want to adjust, see what I need to adjust for. Uh, and so I will tell it the exposure is CRC. Uh, the outcome is microbiome. Uh, and then I just you know make the text purple and and add a theme so that we can so it's nicer looking. Uh, and to to probably no surprise, we see that we need to adjust for our four confounders, which are age, diet, gender, and health status. We get this nice plot here. We don't need to adjust for hospitalization. It is a collider. Uh, it's possible that introduced selection bias, especially if maybe we we're only sampling people who were hospitalized or only sampling people who weren't hospitalized, that could be selection bias. But um, these are the four variables we need to adjust for. So now we'll actually download the data. Um, we do this uh, using this curated metagenomic data function. Uh, we're just going to use, th there's multiple data sources for, for a lot of these studies. We're just going to use the uh, stool samples. Um, so we get this object. Uh, we can take a look at it. Right, it's a um, expression set. So, oops, so we can view it. Um, or sorry, it's not an expression set. I forget what kind of object it is. But it has different components of it, uh, including an expression set. Uh, by the way, curated metagenomic data will soon be using summarized experiments, so it should be more convenient. Um, but the part we're interested in is getting that expression set from it. So we will we will take that. Uh, this expression set has a um, has a, a variable called study condition, which is the exposure. So if we look at a table of that, we see that we have 52 controls, 52 cases, and six where this uh, was not available. I think I've looked into this one. It's because uh, they, yeah, they just didn't have the disease status for these people. Uh, we're just going to exclude them. Uh, it might be important if your data, you know, are missing variables like this. That might be an important question to ask: is why am I missing this? Uh, but we'll we'll just subset this. Uh, and and take only the the people who had a study condition, uh, and so if we do our table again now, we see that we've got 52 cases and 52 controls. Um, next, the question is, well, what do we actually have data for in terms of uh, confound you know these confounders that I'm interested in? Well, if I look at the column names in the phenotypic data, uh, I see I've got uh, the subject ID, the body site. Uh, they're all all the body sites are probably fecal, uh, antibiotics used, you know, study condition, which is our exposure of interest. Um, we've got age and age category. We've got gender, but we don't have, you know, a general health status. It doesn't look like, and we don't have. Uh, I don't see a diet here. Nope. Uh, some of these I think have diet. This one doesn't. Um, so we don't have diet. So those are unmeasured confounders. And unfortunately, th those will be limitations of the work I do today. Um, you know, I, ideally we would have those, but without them, we just cannot adjust for those confounders. Um, so uh, the, the next step, what I'm going to do, um, you don't have to do this kind of step-by-step -step in the way that I'm, I'm going to, but, um, it, it's always good to look at just the uh, bivariate relationship between the exposure and the outcome, uh, and then add your con add your confounders or 
as covariates to that model and, and see how that changes things. Um, you know, in, in predictive modeling, we often like build up either using, you know, you know, by adding uh, variables to our model or by, you know, removing variables until we get the best model possible. We don't need to do that in causal inference. What we are, we are less interested in building the perfect model. Um, we're more interested in making sure that we are building a model that fits in with our theory of the causal relationship. So our model needs to be theory driven rather than data driven uh, primarily because uh, yeah, we're more interested in testing this theory that we have rather than building a perfect predictive model. Prediction is, well, is a, a separate conceptually uh, compared to, to um, to uh, causal inference. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll convert this to a PhiloSeq object. Um, and then uh, we will convert that to, to DSeq2. Um, it converts some of them to vectors, that's fine. Uh, and then, uh, by the way, we specified in this model for DSeq2 that uh, the uh, condition of interest is our study condition, so that's colorectal cancer versus controls. Uh, and then uh, we run our, our DE-seq model. Um, we fit it, we, we get some results. So we can, we can look at these results. It's going to be this rather large table with 1,296 different uh, taxa of bacteria. Uh, where we've got a mean value, our log two fold change, so uh, kind of our, our effect uh, and our p values, but we're more interested in you know just significant p values or close to significant p values. So I'm going to specify an alpha of, of 0.10 uh, and then uh, just filter it down to that. Um, and so once once I do that with the, these steps, I see that there were five, you know, marginally significant uh, after adjustment for multiple comparisons, uh, significant bacteria. So, Escheria, the genera, you know, two two species, um, two others uh, that that uh, the Rumacacus and the E. coli that were that were significant. So this is just the bivariate comparison. I haven't adjusted for anything yet. So the question is, you know, will this is this effect still going to 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 be there when I adjust for um, some confounders? And I I I don't have data on health status or diet, but I do have data on age and gender. So I'm going to add those to my model. So I just uh, now I specify this phyloseq to deseq function, but now I, I add these additional age category and gender uh, parameters to my model. Uh, and then I rerun the, the same, same code as before. Uh, and this time, uh, now we see that uh, after adjustment uh, for uh, age and gender, we now only have two significant variables, uh, S. rumicaucus and T. 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 rumicaucus. I'm still not sure what the T stands for in that, but um, we can. I've got more information here. So it's um, okay. So so the second one is an unclassified strain of, of the same species. So it's one species um, that seems to be significantly associated with uh, colorectal cancer when adjusting for age and gender. Uh, and we, we have our log two full change, which we can use as our effect size. And we can look at that effect size. It, it's changed. Uh, so here we've got effect sizes of 1.2 and 1.7 uh, for for S rumicaucus and T rumicaucus respectively. If we look at our unadjusted model uh, estimates for S rumicaucus, well, it didn't change too much, 1.2 and 1.7, huh? But they have changed slightly. So that is how adjustment affects, you know, your effect size will change uh, and variables that were significant may not be significant anymore once you've adjusted for variables. Uh, so that's a real quick and dirty example of, of how we might go from creating a DAG to uh, to testing that DAG in R. Uh, obviously, when you do this in real life, you maybe think about it more. Maybe 
you revise uh, your assumptions or, or think about your DAG as you get the results. Um, yeah, any questions? I'm monitoring chat, I don't see any questions, uh, but I, I highly recommend the best way to do this is to, to learn by doing and, and to sit there and just think through uh, an example uh, that's of interest to you and then uh, you know run it through this and, and see how that, what results you get and how, how you can think about that. Um, and so uh, I've been going for nearly two hours, but um, I do have some examples here, uh, which I, we don't need to talk about these two, but I do want to talk about the, this third one because we did touch on this um, a bit um, earlier. Uh, and I want to pose this question to the, to the group. Uh, one important subject that well, I briefly touched on was generalizability or transportability of causal findings. So what we focused on here was, you know, interpreting, you know, trying to come up with a causal estimate internally. You know, we've got a sample. How do we, you know, estimate a, a causal effect internally? But then there's this, this is only one part of, of this problem. The next problem is taking these findings and applying it to a general population. Uh, and so, uh, already, you know, people have mentioned some of the issues that might arise when trying to do this. The participants in the study might be different from the general population. They may, may be more eager to participate in health research. Um, but are there other issues that you think could arise if you try and take the findings, uh, whether it's from an observational study where you try to estimate a causal effect or an RCT uh, where you tried to estimate a, you know, a causal effect? And uh, how could we potentially use a DAG to resolve issues of generalizability and transportability? And again, this is, this is not a question of a right answer. I'm not looking for any one answer in particular. It's actually a question uh, if you go to recent epi journals uh, and look at some of their commentaries and debates that they've been having, uh, th there, there's very fierce debate about this. So I'm always curious to think what, what people think because uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough question. Any thoughts? If if not, I can keep going. But um, yeah, ch it, maybe chat is isn't the best because you have to kind of type an essay for this one. I feel like sometimes. But uh, well, when I think about this a lot, I I think about the fact yeah that my my study population might differ from a general population, uh, and so I might think about how variables in my DAG might be different in a general population relative to my sample? And if so, how differences in those variables could affect the causal effect that I observe? Um, that's a very general answer and a, a very basic way of thinking about it. But uh, that, that's what I think about and think about, you know, like, okay, if I'm giving this drug, you know, to participants in my study, and I know that it varies based on age. Well, I've got a certain age group here. How might, if my age group is distributed differently in the general population, how would that affect my results? And you could actually even think about adjusting your, you know, like weighting your sample population to meet the weights of the age of the general population and seeing how that changes the results you have. So you can use variables from your DAG as you think about the generalizability of your findings. Uh, so to wrap things up, I, I, I wish I could come here today and, and tell you like causal inference, here's what you do, this step, this step, this step. Uh, unfortunately, 
it's not that simple. This this is a, a a theoretical problem, and we have to be thoughtful as we think through the hypotheses and theories that are are driving the causal questions that we're we're asking. Uh, and we have to think through what we think could introduce bias as we try and answer those questions. Uh, so one epidemiologist, Miguel Hernan, uh, says uh, that DAGs are probably the most important tool that we have for uh, visualizing causal mechanisms and uh, and identifying uh, what we need to adjust for and uh, what the limitations of our studies are. And he uh, has a saying, draw your assumptions before you draw your conclusions, uh, as in make your DAG and then use that as, as you draw conclusions from your research. Um, uh, Crystal says he has a lot of thoughts on causal inference. Yes, he does. It's it's his main field of study, uh, and and uh, he's got a lot to say about it. And I'll I'll talk about some of his materials, which you can uh, look at if you want to learn more in a moment. Uh, but I just want to mention that unmeasured confounding, selection bias, and other sources of bias uh, are a difficult problem that we don't necessarily always have an easy answer for. Um, However, it's important just to acknowledge that these issues exist, to think about how they might affect our data and think about how ideally, you know, like we can think about this at any point of our study. We can think about it when we're designing our study about how we might uh, solve these problems. We can think about when we're doing the analysis and think about how these problems might affect what we're finding and the limitations of our current project. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, is, it's important because we want to know what causes other things. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in what I have presented here today uh, and what, what we've worked on together, uh, this was a super fast, very uh, broad overview of, of epidemiology and causal inference. Um, but I highly recommend uh, looking at some of these materials I've listed here. Uh, Pearl and Mackenzie, Pearl is uh, one of the, the, the kind of uh, fathers of modern modern causal inference, uh, and he uh, collaborated with a journalist to write this book called *The Book of Why: The New Science of Causal Effect*. It is a very easy read. It's written for like a mass market audience, uh, and therefore I find it to be it's enjoyable. It's got a lot of fun stories of causal inference. It, it's a lot of fun. It's not it's not a scientific book in it's not like a textbook it's more of a a, a, a non-fiction book that that's fun to read and you'll, you'll still learn a ton about causal inference from it um if you want something a little more on the technical side of things for, with some actual you know like uh r code and math uh oops i wanted to open that new window uh there is uh this book that is available for free uh i'll put a link to it in chat um, by Miguel Hernan, who I, who I just mentioned, as well as Jamie Robbins. Uh, the book is available free online, uh, and it is this excellent uh, textbook of causal inference. Uh, it goes a lot more into detail uh, about the math behind causal inference. Um, you'll see that there is a lot more uh, math here, a lot more about the probabilities and uh, uh, all, all that, which I, I didn't want to, to get too much into and and today. Uh, but then he will also, I think later on in the book, there's a lot more um, uh, examples of practical applications of causal inference in research. Uh, and he includes our code. So uh, it's all available here. Uh, and finally, uh, if if you are a real big uh, fan of, of math and computer science, you can read Pearl's uh, book called Causality: Models, Reasoning, and Inference. Um, it is it is not a book that I find easy to understand, but uh, yeah. Uh, but it, 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 if you are interested, that that is an excellent. Uh, it is a very thorough book on on causal inference. It's just very difficult to understand uh, for people who don't have a very strong mathematics and computer science background. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you want something with some kind of guided lectures and readings, Hernan also made a, a, a free uh, edX course. Um, uh, so uh, this will be more of like a structured course on causal inference uh, that you can do at your own pace. Uh, and uh, 
it, I have not done it personally, but I've heard from other people who said it's quite good. Uh, so I just want to thank you all again for having me here today and for listening to me talk and, and participating. Uh, this was a great honor and I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chloe, for this amazing workshop. So please, if you have any question, can you post your question in the chat? Questions? <laughs> thank you all for your nice messages. Uh, okay. Um, so we have a question here. So, so it's from, uh, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Ike, Ike Young uh, asks, I was wondering if it is possible to find a causal relationship from a data set of, of uh, a cross-sectional survey. That is a really important and interesting question. It's actually something that's really funny because I was just having a debate with a co-author about this this week uh, over email. Um, so uh, I want to make it uh, you know, clear, we, we probably can't prove that there's a causal relationship using cross-sectional data. You know, you need to, you need to show that one variable comes before the other. You need to show, you know, that, that there's like some temporality to it, you know, that like the cause precedes the effect is important. And if we have cross-sectional data, establishing that might be kind of difficult. But that being said, if we draw a DAG and we say, okay, we believe, you know, if we look at this cross-sectional data of people who smoke, and we also have data on whether they have lung cancer or not, again, to use this example, but we can use a different example. Let me switch things up. Uh, we can say people who um, drink a lot of sugary soda and look at whether they have diabetes or not. We could cross-sectionally look at that. We could you know, take a group of 100 people and say, okay, do you drink soda? Yes or no. Do you have diabetes? Yes or no. And we could find, you know, maybe let's say um, those who drink soda are much more likely to have diabetes. And that finding is an association. It's a, you know, it's a correlation. We're not sure that that's causal. But what we can also do, again, is, is draw the DAG. So, what we would do is draw the DAG of what we would imagine the relationship to be between consumption of, of you know, sugary soda and diabetes. And we draw that DAG, we, we draw in any potential confounders, you know, there's probably a genetic component. Uh, you know, there's probably other aspects of the diet that could confound this relationship. Um, and then tr using those, try and get as close as possible to controlling for, every potential confounder we could think of. Uh, and at that point, uh, then uh, we could, could say, okay, well, obviously this is cross-sectional data. We are limited by that. There are probably unmeasured confounders. There's the possibility of selection bias, but you know, we, we're providing some evidence for there potentially being a causal relationship. And uh, you know, just, we're, we're not proving it, but maybe, you know, we've adjusted for a lot of different things uh, and this effect is still there. So uh, if it's not causal, you know, then what are what else is, is there and what else could it be? And, and start thinking about it that way. And so maybe it doesn't prove it yes or no for us in this cross-sectional survey, but maybe it informs a, first, a future research project where we design something longitudinal, where we're able to provide, where we're, able to get even closer to proving something. And then maybe that informs an RCT or uh, some kind of, you know, Mendelian randomization where, where we're able to even get closer to, to something that, that, that uh, we, we feel more comfortable in making a causal claim from. And, and so that's what I think, think a lot of this is about. It's not about yes or no on causation, like did we prove it or not, but, but providing evidence for it and making an argument for it. So that was a really good question. Thank you for, for asking that. So everyone is saying thank you. I thank you all for attending. Yeah. 
It's a great and wonderful workshop. Yep. And if anyone mm -hmm. has any questions, any other questions that come up over time, my email address is in the in the presentation. I as uh, the, you know, the few people who work with me who are here know, I am very happy to tank, talk about this with anyone at length uh, and maybe even bore you with how much I think about this. So if you just ever wanna drop me a line and talk about this more, uh, talk about your own research and think through it together, I'm always happy to talk about it with you. So just send me an email. Okay. I think we don't have more questions. Let's see. Oh, yes. Can we get access to your HTML page? Uh, yes. So uh, if you go on GitHub, uh, I believe there's a way. Yeah. If you go to the, the GitHub pages, I'll, I'll put the link in, in chat. Um, th there is a, an HTML version. Uh, if you go up here uh, to here, that that's just a link to the uh, README, but this will be the actual link to the workshop. It might be a version that's a a day or two old as I was working on this, but um, it has most of the information. Yeah, it's, I didn't change any of the information. I just added some questions. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. So we'll send you the these links and the recording of the workshop. Thank you for joining. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank this you is awesome. For, for this amazing, really amazing workshop. <laughs> thank you. I I, I love giving this workshop. I uh, this is a great group. I, you had some really interesting questions and thoughts. So yeah, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, look, everyone is putting the hearts. You know, the reaction is really amazing. Many people really enjoyed this workshop. Thank yeah, you so much. I'm very glad. Very good. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think, okay, if you don't have more questions, so thank you very much. Stay tuned. We'll have our next workshop about the um, transcriptomics, uh, bulk RNA, uh, sick and uh, single cell RNA sick. So stay tuned. It will be on April, I think, 9. 9. Yeah, so it will be coming soon. We'll send you uh, the. Um, okay, so we we'll send you the recording and the links we had today. And I think that's all. So